Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are. I want to welcome you to this one-hour webinar on building a strong, sustainable teacher workforce, which is jointly hosted by the Learning Policy Institute, the Council of Chief State School Officers, and the National Council Conference of State Legislators. As we can see in the headlines across the country, many states are struggling with teacher shortages, particularly in the perennial shortage areas of mathematics, science, special education, and bilingual education. Today's webinar is designed to provide state leaders and others with the most recent national data on teacher supply and demand, and then to feature recent actions taken in two states, South Dakota and Indiana, to address the teacher shortage. We hope we can offer a productive, open conversation about a pressing issue that requires both political parties to work across the aisle to advance evidence-based solutions. I want to thank the Council of Chief State School Officers and the National Conference of State Legislators for co-sponsoring this webinar with LPI. The webinar is designed for a state policymaker audience. However, we also want to remind the audience that this webinar is open to the public and it is being recorded. Both the recording and the slides will be posted online in a few days. We also encourage you to engage in the conversation on social media using the hashtag Solving Teacher Shortages. Our webinar today will feature three panelists. Linda Darling-Hammond, President of the Learning Policy Institute, will present findings from LPI's recent report, A Coming Crisis in Teaching, Teacher Supply, Demand, and Shortages in the United States one of a series of four reports that LPI released in September on the teacher shortage and evidence-based responses to it. We'll then hear from South Dakota Secretary of Education and Council of Chief State School Officers member, Melody Schopp, who will share South Dakota's experiences with teacher shortage and the steps the state has taken to respond. She will be followed by Repres Representative Robert Benning, Chairman of the Education Committee for the Indiana House of Representatives, who will share Indiana's actions to address the teacher shortage. We will have at least 10 minutes for questions and answers at the close of the webinar. Before I turn the webinar over to Linda Darling-Hammond for her presentation, let me briefly introduce her. Linda is President and CEO of the Learning Policy Institute, and also Charles E. Ducommon Professor Emeritus at Stanford University, where she founded the Stanford Center for Opportunity Policy and Education, and served as the faculty sponsor of the Stanford Teacher Education Program, which she helped to redesign. Linda has consulted widely with federal, state, and local policymakers and educators on strategies for improving education policies and practices. I will now turn the webinar over to Linda. Good morning, uh, or good afternoon. Uh, I'm going to share my screen so that I hope you can see my slides, and there they are. Um, I want to acknowledge my co-authors in this report, uh, Lee Sucher and Desiree Carver-Thomas. Uh, and we took this up because of the anecdotal reports that were coming uh, across our desks uh, from across the country as newspapers began reporting teacher shortages uh, both last year and this past fall. Uh, and the evidence this fall seems to be that they're more stark than they were even the year before. One reason for these shortages is that teacher preparation enrollments have dropped uh, by about 35% over the last five years, so there are fewer people coming into the profession. This is not surprising because we had layoffs of teachers during the fiscal recession, and if you were a thoughtful young person thinking about where to choose a career, coming into one where there were few jobs available made little sense. Uh, so we expect some uptick in enrollments, but uh, the decline was very severe and the upticks thus far have been fairly small. Uh, as a result, you can see that uh, the um, supply and demand for teachers has crossed and is going uh, in opposing directions. Demand is increasing as a function of uh, the fact that districts are trying to reduce their class sizes and increase their program offerings to return to where they were before the recession. We have some growth in enrollments and we have continuing turnover of teachers each year. The supply uh, has been declining as I described. Uh, that really uh, crossed in about 2013 uh, and there is 
uh, approximately 100,000 teacher differential that could uh, be in place by 2018 unless the trends that we've been seeing begin to change. Uh, the variability of shortages from state to state is quite substantial. Uh, you can see one of the high shortage states like Arizona uh, has uh, a low level of salary competitiveness with non-teacher salaries uh, based on teacher surveys, <clears throat> lower than average working conditions, and very high teacher attrition. <clears throat> By contrast, a state like Oregon, uh, which has uh, better competitiveness of salaries uh, and better perceived working conditions by teachers, has low teacher attrition. And these kinds of differentials pertain across the country. Uh, shortages also vary by subject area. The most severe shortages have been in special education, 48 states plus the District of Columbia mathematics and science, both above 40 states, reporting severe shortages to the federal government. As is often the case, this results in equity concerns. Uh, the proportion of teachers who are not fully prepared uh, is about four times higher in high minority schools than it is in low minority schools across the country. Uh, and in some states, uh, as many as 20% of the teachers right now are uncertified in high minority schools. This kind of exacerbates the leaky bucket that we experience in teaching, uh, where when teachers come in without preparation into a job that is really quite challenging, uh, we typically see lower student outcomes and much higher attrition, two to three times greater than the attrition rates of those who are well prepared. Uh, and attrition is really one of our big problems. It drives teacher demand. Uh, in 2015-16, uh, 97 percent of the demand was because of attrition. Uh, and even looking forward into the future with growing enrollments and other factors, it will still be the lion's share of attrition, well over 80 percent. And most of this attrition is actually uh, not retirement. It happens before the retirement age, about two-thirds of those who leave are leaving for reasons other than retirement. Uh, and you can see that if we were to be able to reduce attrition from 8%, our current U.S. rate, to about 4%, which is the rate in places like uh, Singapore, Finland, Ontario, Canada, where they sort of hover between 3 and 4% attrition each year, we would actually solve the teacher shortage in terms of numbers uh, because uh, we would have uh, enough uh, supply, even with our reduced supply now, uh, to meet the demand. That doesn't mean we would have a balance across all states and subject areas. That would likely still be a problem requiring some policy attention, uh, but the scale of the overall problem would be much less. And we can think about one of the goals of solving shortages as being really a 4% solution, that is getting to a place where we keep the teachers we have uh, so that we don't have this continual revolving door or leaky bucket, depending on which metaphor you prefer. So who leaves teaching at higher rates? We know that beginning teachers leave at higher rates, typically about 30% leave within the first five years of teaching, many more in rural and urban areas quite often. Math and science teachers who are in short supply anyway are leaving at higher rates. Special education teachers, teachers of English learners, also a shortage area in more than 30 states. Teachers in high poverty, high minority schools leave at much higher rates, and these are also schools that tend to be under-resourced and have very uh, high levels of pupil needs in addition to their academic needs. And teachers of color who actually are overrepresented in those high poverty, high minority schools. So even while we want to create a more diverse teaching workforce, uh, we have a very high attrition rate of those teachers who we have been successful in recruiting, but much less successful in retaining. Teachers leave primarily those who leave other than for retirement because of dissatisfactions with teaching. Um, they may also leave for family or personal reasons to pursue another job, which is typically linked to some 
form of dissatisfaction. Uh, the dissatisfaction um, areas that are cited by teachers, uh, interestingly, in the last uh, round of um, the schools and staffing survey, was headed by accountability pressures to teach to the test or concerns about uh, sanctions and penalties. Administrative support is always an important reason for teachers to stay or leave, and working conditions always figure prominently. And as I've noted, there are a variety of other reasons of which retirement is less than a third. Administrative support uh, does really impact teacher turnover, and you can see that uh, for teachers who strongly agree that their administration is supportive, the rate of leaving is less than half of that for those who strongly disagree. We also took a look at what would bring leavers back with all these teachers who do leave. Uh, some of them do come back. Uh, about a third of those teachers who leave uh, come back, and it varies depending on the attractiveness of teaching. Uh, you can see that a number of the reasons that or a number of the uh, incentives that teachers cite are financial in nature, uh, the ability to maintain retirement benefits. Uh, often that is uh, also due to crossing state lines where state pensions cannot be um, taken with you. Uh, salary, uh, forgiveness of student loans is very important as young people come in with greater debt uh, to a profession that tends to pay them less than many others. Housing incentives is uh, very important in some places like California where the housing costs are very high. Uh, there are also teaching conditions like class sizes and student loans. And then there are things like being able to renew a certificate or to transfer a certificate or credential into another state um, to have childcare and part-time teaching positions. So districts and states can look for incentives of several kinds if they want to bring teachers back into the profession. Um, as a, Senator Benning knows we've been looking at what uh, high-achieving nations do. Uh, Indiana has been really studying this question. Uh, and what we see in the high-achieving nations that do have very strong, stable teaching forces is that they peg salaries to those of engineers and accountants uh, and pay teachers equivalently across schools. Uh, they offer strong preparation, and it's typically for free or at very reduced cost. Uh, often with a stipend or a salary while you're training, uh, and extensive training in partner schools so the teachers feel clinically ready to go into the classroom, followed by mentoring uh, by trained mentors, uh, 15 to 20 hours a week for collaborative planning, lots of collegial learning opportunities, many opportunities to develop and share expertise across classrooms and schools. And we know that these are factors that matter a great deal in recruiting and retaining teachers. Compensation matters, especially for recruitment, um, although it can also matter uh, to some extent for retention. Uh, preparation, uh, those who are prepared stay longer uh, and are more effective sooner. Uh, mentoring and induction makes a huge that's my phone giving me some notice about the schedule. Um, a mentoring and induction uh, process really makes a difference in keeping teachers and, of course, teaching conditions. And where are we in the country on those things? Well, in terms of compensation, U.S. teachers make about 20% less than other college graduates, even after you take into account the difference in their um, annual work schedule and the differential increases by mid-career. We've lost ground on salaries since the 1990s. Uh, average salaries range significantly across the um, country. In 2013, you can see that Montana was at a very low low of $27,000 for an interview teacher. Um, and uh, Arkansas, which is going to figure in our story later, had really made um, efforts to improve salaries, so they were near the top of the rankings. Um, however, in more than 30 states, a mid-career teacher which, who has a family of four is actually eligible for several forms of government assistance. Uh, for example, their children would be likely on free and reduced price lunch. 
Uh, and that's obviously not um, reaching the level of a middle class career that highly educated people uh, will want to come into and stay in. Uh, as we've noted, preparation and mentoring matter, but funding for both has declined. Uh, huge debt load for all young people going to college, and that's true for teachers. Uh, only about two-thirds of teachers now are receiving comprehensive preparation before they enter, uh, which means that the attrition rates are driven higher. And fewer are receiving mentoring and principal support than was true even a few years ago before the recession, when about 75% were receiving that support. By 2012, it had dropped to 59%. Teaching conditions are challenging for U.S. teachers who have more teaching hours and less planning time than others anywhere in the world. We're tied with Chile for the most teaching hours per week and per year um, and very near the bottom in planning time, which makes uh, the work of teaching more stressful. And uh, work environments became less collaborative over the last decade, only 15% of teachers reported collaborative environments, and resources for teaching, of course, have declined because of the recession. Um, 36 states are spending less uh, on education now than they were in 2007. Um, that means that class sizes are larger, supplies of materials are more scarce, particularly in low-income, um, low-wealth school districts. Uh, and all of the resources that help teaching are less available. Meanwhile, we've had growth in child poverty, homelessness, uh, and trauma, which in many communities makes teaching uh, even more challenging. This teacher uh, who moved to Arkansas from Oklahoma uh, explained how those resources matter. She said, it wasn't the school's fault. If it was, it wouldn't have been so difficult for me to leave. It's just that Arkansas has more resources. They just make teaching easier. She got a 25% salary increase, uh, reading and math facilitators, and allowance for classroom materials. Uh, note that I had pointed out that Arkansas has made investments um, in teaching and is having many fewer teacher shortages uh, than its neighbor, Oklahoma. Uh, teaching attractiveness does vary across the states, and we ranked the states on their compensation, turnover rates, teachers' views of the teaching conditions, and the level of qualifications. You can find an interactive map on our website, learningpolicyinstitute.org, um, and click on your state and see how it ranks in terms of teaching attractiveness and teacher equity. Uh, these states were ranked among the more attractive, uh, as you can see, across the country. Uh, the states uh, in the lighter color were ra rated as the less attractive states, um, and they do tend to be the states with the higher uh, levels of teacher shortages. We have four kinds of policy recommendations that I'm going to briefly review, and we can talk about more in our conversations later, and you can find them in our report. Obviously, compensation makes a difference. Um, thinking about how to make salaries equitable across districts is also important as making them more competitive with other occupations, particularly important for math and science and careers like that where the alternatives are uh, very uh, widely available and better paying. But um, sometimes when salaries are not easy to raise or um, the needs are more targeted, you can also think about financial incentives like uh, underwriting teachers' mortgages, um, providing um, guarantees, down payment assistance. Uh, in some places uh, like San Francisco, they're even building housing for teachers uh, and providing things like child care um, uh, incentives. Uh, building the supply of people who will stay. Forgivable loans and scholarships have been very successful uh, in the past, both federally and at the state level, uh, where uh, highly qualified young people, either going into undergraduate or graduate level programs, are given uh, support, uh, usually a, a full tuition uh, payment, in return for teaching in the state for three to five years. 
uh, usually in high need fields and in high need locations. There are also high retention preparation pathways important for rural districts as well as urban districts. Grow Your Own programs are funded by some states where young people from communities um, who want to teach, there may even be teacher cadet programs or future teacher programs that get them interested in high school, um, receive scholarship aid to come back to their community uh, and to then spend uh, at least some minimum number of years, it's usually four or five. Uh, and because people often like to teach where they grew up or went to school, these program pathways are very important. Teacher residencies are another means there are urban and rural teacher residencies across the country where people who have already um, finished their undergraduate programs, they may have gone off for another career, come in, they're placed under the wing of an expert urban or rural teacher, um, they get credential coursework from a partnering university that's tightly linked to their clinical experience. At the end of the year, they get a master's degree and they get uh, the opportunity for um, mentoring, uh, and they get a job, and they pledge to stay in that district. So these kinds of approaches can plug the leaky bucket uh, and allow a state and districts to move forward with a stable teaching force. Obviously, if we want to improve retention, being sure that beginners get high-quality mentoring is very important, and then training administrators so that they can create the kind of collegial work environments with shared input and decision-making that teachers crave is also important. And finally, about 25% of teachers do move across the country, and many of them stop teaching when they get to a new state because their license is difficult to transfer or they can't bring their pension. So states can do a lot to attract teachers by improving reciprocity and thinking about pension portability. Uh, some states have solved this problem before. In the 1990s, Connecticut and North Carolina both had shortages, which they eliminated within a few years, and both dramatically increased achievement. Uh, Connecticut became the highest scoring state in the nation. On national assessments, reduced its achievement uh, gap. North Carolina became the first southern state to break the glass ceiling and become uh, a state scoring in the top half of the nation and had the biggest reduction in the achievement gap, and they used very similar strategies, um, increasing and equalizing salaries, offering those service scholarships and loans. Both of them raised standards for teachers while they raised salaries, so they got people who were better prepared, knew more about their content, knew more about how to teach it, how to teach literacy, how to teach special needs students, uh, and as a consequence, that also reinforced retention uh, both put in place mentoring with trained mentors and very widely available professional development. And probably among the most important things they both did was to train principals to create strong teaching environments and to support the quality of teaching. And to close, uh, I just want to suggest we can solve this again. Um, Kirsten Ruggett, a 20-year veteran in Minneapolis, put it well, she said, for the past decade, I've worked at a school where 97% of the children qualify for free and reduced price lunch. I stay because the school climate is good for children and teachers alike. I stay because my principal is wonderful, supports us, does what's best for children, and because I trust her. I stay because my colleagues are gifted teachers and good company, and because I continually learn from them. I think at the end of the day, that's what most teachers want in their career, uh, and with some focus, we can provide it. Uh, you can download this report from our website and a fact sheet about what states can do to address the teacher shortage um, from the um, web uh, address right here. And I'm going to pass the ball. Thank you, Linda. A quick reminder to the audience, if you'd like to ask questions or engage in discussion, you can do so by using the Q&A box at the right side of your screen, um, or uh, through Twitter using the hashtag Solving Teacher Shortages. Uh, now we're going to hear from South Dakota's Secretary of Education, Melody Schaap. 
Secretary Schopp is a lifelong educator with 23 years of classroom teacher prior to coming to the South Dakota Department of Education in 2000. She served as a school board member for nine years in Lemon, South Dakota, following her departure from teaching. Secretary Schopp worked in a number of different roles in the department, including deputy secretary. She was appointed as cabinet secretary for education in 2011, where she has especially focused on assuring that students are well prepared for careers and post-secondary education after leaving the K-12 system. Secretary Schopp works closely with the South Dakota higher education system. I will now turn the webinar over to Secretary Schopp. Good morning and thank you very much. I'm pleased to be here today and I'm going to tell the South Dakota story in that I think it speaks to many of the things that Linda Darling Hammond spoke to this morning um, along with some of the things that were specific to South Dakota. Like all of you, we continue to hear about the teacher shortage in our state and this was exaggerated by the fact that we were dead last in teacher salaries, um, 51st in the nation and nothing to be proud of for sure. And as was explained, we found our shortages were both geographic and content specific. And when I say geographic, this was even more troubling in some of our very, very remote poverty-stricken reservation schools. Um, and you know, there was a lot of anecdotal information, like I'm sure that all of you heard each year, but it became louder and louder about over the last, you know, four to five years. And this was not anymore just limited to those content-specific things like math or science or special ed or just in those areas. We were seeing or hearing that we had shortages from across the state. So our governor, who um, again I have to give a lot of credit to as being a very, very thoughtful leader, asked that we would put together a task force to really study that issue to assure that we were addressing it thoroughly and, and really spoke to many of the things that Linda brought up in, in the former presentation. So in 2015, he created a Blue Ribbon Task Force, um, and I can tell you there was a lot of rolling of eyes across the state because there had been task force many years that had gone on and really nothing ever came out of them. But this was very specific to really evaluate the current funding formula to analyze and collect data and to engage with stakeholders and get public input. And that, you know, I really, of all the things that we did, this was such a critical first step. And then the final charge was that they were to make recommendations as passed in the legislature. And that task force represented um, people from the executive and legislative branches, teachers, administrators, school board members, parents, businesses, tax, 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 excuse me, taxpayers as well. But prior to that Blue Ribbon Task Force, the chairs of our education committees went out and did roundtable meetings in many communities and engaged with over um, a couple thousand people at each community setting to gather input about what they saw as an issue. Uh, not, the report came out after that task force, and I'm just going to highlight some really high-level data points that they found that we based the recommendations on. Number one, we were not only lagging in salaries by being 51st in the nation compared to other professions, but we continued to lose our teachers to bordering states. So we weren't getting teachers in but when teachers saw that we had the salaries in the states that were touching us, in Wyoming or North Dakota or, or Minnesota, they were jumping the borders. Number two, we learned that teacher turnover was not exclusive to salaries. But in South Dakota, because we were 51st, it was a significant factor. Number three, we did do the data analysis and we found that the incoming pipeline that we had was not going to meet the projected needs of our districts looking ahead five years. So this is what we did in, the, in the, the past year. We first addressed the salary issue, and that had to be done. And so the legislation that moved forward suggested that we had a tax increase in our sales tax devoted to increasing teacher pay. Now, we are a very conservative red state, and we had a lot of people who said this was never going to be done. But I do have to say that what happened with this, with the leadership from a very conservative Republican governor taking the charge, we had a coalition of every single education group. We got our business community together. The retailers came on board as well as other groups and came forward to support this. Um, it did pass narrowly by one vote in each house, and we adopted a new formula that raised our target salary by $8,000. Now, that did not mean every teacher got that 
Some got more, some got less, but that's the average target that we are looking for to get us out of 51st. But I think it's what was stated previously, that in addition to that, there were some really critical pieces that we did in addition to just increasing teacher salaries. Because the task force determined that we would continue to have shortages in our state if we continue to do school the way it's always been done. We have that, that practice that we've had for years of having one teacher for each classroom, which we all grew up with and we believed was right. But a companion bill, in along with the increase in, in uh, taxes for teacher pay, put into place some additional funding that supported a little bit more of the untraditional methods to support teachers by giving out shared service grants where you would share services amongst districts and whether that was teachers or resources. We expanded extensively our online learning opportunities to provide opportunities for classrooms to have um, whatever class they have so that you were not limited geographically or in any other way by having high quality teachers within the classroom with the facilitation happening at that home base. We also um, put into the budget grants for innovation and customized learning that would support that idea of the way that school could look moving forward. And additionally, we found that if we really want to support our teaching force, we needed to support those new teachers coming into the field. So there was funding put forward, and I'm proud to say for a statewide mentoring program. It not only included mentoring for the first and second year teachers, but also included a new teacher academy in the summer to bring together the mentors and the mentees to discuss those first year struggles that they had and really provide them a cohort of people to gather together. Additionally, we um, passed legislation that dealt with direct reciprocity among states so that we would have that support as teachers come into the state to make it less onerous to become a South Dakota teacher. We also put financial incentives together for teachers that go above and beyond by incentivizing national board certification. One of the other things that we also found that was stated in Linda's presentation was the need for providing scholarships, and we did it in two different ways. There was a bill that passed to support a Grow Your Own program for paraprofessionals in some of our, our really difficult to fill areas, and that was in our reservation schools and it provided opportunities for them to complete a bachelor's degree to become a teacher, again, to stay within that area where sometimes we have a very difficult time in attracting teachers. We also put additional funding into a scholarship program that we currently have for individuals who have claimed um, teaching preparation as their program to pay for their second and, or excuse me, for their third and fourth year of their program, again, promising to stay within the state for up to five years and this was in the high content needs that we had across the state, math, science, special education, music, et cetera. With all those things, though, again, I think the thing I wanted to emphasize from what was successful in South Dakota in this really comprehensive package, it wasn't just salary, it wasn't just these other pieces, but it was looking at more comprehensively. But I think the most important piece I would like to point out is that in the whole process, it was the importance and the value of the coalition building that we did prior to implementing any sort of policy change. And so with that, um, I would definitely be open for questions later, and I, I'd like to thank you for this opportunity, and I would turn it back to Patrick. Thank, thank you, Secretary Shop. Um, a quick reminder, again, if you want to ask any questions or engage in discussion, to use the question and answer box in the right part of the screen or uh, to engage in social, me social media through uh, solving the hashtag solving teacher shortages. We will um, now hear from uh, Representative Bob Benning, who chairs the Education Committee for the Indiana House of Representatives. Uh, Representative Benning has served as a Republican member of the Indiana State Legislature since 1992 a career that spans nearly a quarter of a century. Throughout his tenure, he has advocated for education reform in Indiana, where most recently he is leading Indiana to find the next generation of assessments for the state. Outside of the legislature, Rep uh, Representative Benning is a leader in the National Conference of State Legislatures, where he serves as an early learning fellow, the vice chair of the NCSL Committee on Education and the International Study Committee. I'll now turn the webinar over to Representative Benning. Good morning or good afternoon, I guess, wherever you're located. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present on Indiana. Um, 
we uh, began our study um, of the teacher shortage in 2015. We started to notice that we were having uh, problems in terms of uh, finding teachers, specifically in uh, specific content area. Could you advance the first slide, please? Um, we have um, shortages based on content and shortages based on geographic region in Indiana. Um, we know that content was an area specific, as Linda Darling said, uh, generally to uh, science, math, special ed, English language learners, but uh, we're also starting to find more uh, uh, less candidates in elementary education. Um, Indiana still exports uh, teachers with a degree in elementary education. We actually have 43 schools of education in Indiana. Uh, we have a population of 6.7 million. Uh, as we did our study of international education with NCSL, we looked at uh, best practices of other countries. Canada, for instance, with a population of about 34 million, only has 50 schools of education. So we definitely had, have always had a history of educating a significant number of educators, more than we actually, supply was well above demand. But we have started to notice, like I said, in continent area and geographic region, uh, one of the geographic problems is probably common to many states across the country as the uh, people are moving to your urban centers and moving to the cities in terms of, uh, for, for a number of reasons, uh, sometimes it's jobs, quality of life. Uh, but with that happening, we're finding a lot more uh, problems in terms of getting teachers in uh, rural or less populated areas for that reason. Um, next slide, please. Um, one of the things that we took as we, as we looked to try to figure out how we could uh, address this issue, one of the primary things we did is we passed the Next Generation Who's Your Educator Scholarship, which was House Bill um, 1002. Uh, what we were trying to do is we actually, again, were taking a page out of this international study that we had looked at, um, and we were trying to figure out a way to get the brightest and best to go into education. As, as you look at, uh, as we did our study of international ed across the world, uh, most of our industrialized competitors are recruiting their teacher prep students from students entering college that are the top half of students entering college. In the United States, we tend to have more of our students come from the bottom half. So Indiana, we wanted to look at it two different ways. We wanted to try to uh, encourage the brightest and best and as well as provide additional support to them above and beyond some of the other supports we did. So um, it is a targeted, you must have the 20% uh, of the students um, must be in the uh, highest 20% of the graduating class, and they must receive a score in the top 20% on the SAT or uh, ACT examination. We are giving them, um, for that, you'll get a scholarship um, of $7,500 per year for 200 graduates who aspire to be teachers. Just to give you some idea that's stackable, so uh, $7,500 is on top of any other aid that they would have. Indiana has one of the most generous uh, student support uh, programs in the country. We have a program called the 21st Century Scholarship Program where the state aid basically will, uh, if you are eligible and it's needs-based, would end up being uh, qualified. You would have access to a public university at essentially no cost, and this would be stackable on top of that. In return, we're asking for those recipients to uh, teach in Indiana schools. It doesn't have to be a specific uh, geographic location. It, it, it's just Indian, in any Indiana school um, that they choose to teach in, but they would have to teach for five years to be able to be a recipient of that. Next page. Um, advance, please. Um, and I think uh, the Secretary had mentioned trying to be collaborative and it's something that we've talked a lot about at uh, NCSL as well as we, as you look at moving forward any type of legislation to uh, improve the teaching profession, to deal with shortages. Um, this list on this uh, PowerPoint shows a list of all of the uh, supporters of House and Mold Act 1002. So we had State Board of Education, Teachers Union, Stanford Children and Business Community, Catholic Community, Non-Public Educators, uh, AFT, uh, Indiana Small and Rural Business, Ball State University, Indiana uh, Purdue University, all the non-publics. We have 31 non-public universities, Department of Education, even some of the associations like Indiana Speech, Language, Hearing Association. So we tried to be very inclusive in terms of the way 
um, and brought all of these people together in terms of broad support of House Enrolled Act 1002. Advance, please. Um, the, the next uh, slide, um, we talk about further teacher shortage legislation. We have done a couple other things in Indiana. Uh, some of those actually reflecting back again on the international study and, and some things Linda has talked about. One is House Enrolled Act uh, 1005, which dealt with career pathways and teacher mentorship. Um, we had moved away from mentoring teachers, and we went ahead and decided that we needed to put more emphasis and more um, uh, money into that. And the other thing we put in place is Career Pathways, um, which is a program that was corrected or something similar to that. A um, uh, program was developed by Public Impact out of North Carolina, a think tank. Um, we have uh, actually Indianapolis Public Schools is the largest urban district in the country that actually has negotiated Career Pathways into their uh, collective bargaining agreement. And what that actually affords is a career within education rather than moving into administration. And uh, they have four schools today that are career pathways or opportunity culture schools. And teacher leaders in those schools are making up to $16,000 per year above the base rate uh, for the leadership roles. And uh, Public Impact has done a lot of research across the country. There's a number of uh, communities that are embracing ideas like this, and this is one of the things that we found in the international study is that uh, in teaching career, we need to provide more opportunities for upper mobility inside the teaching profession so that they don't go into necessarily go into administration. Uh, if you're a great teacher, we'd rather keep you in the classroom rather than maybe move you in administration. Those skills don't necessarily always move both directions. So um, and the other good thing about career pathways or models like that we're looking at, they're sustainable and re require no additional uh, funding. Uh, House Bill 1004 also, um, we looked at this past session, it did not pass, but there was a significant amount of discussion on providing pay flexibility uh, for hard to fill positions. We know that we have uh, graduated a very, very small number of physics teachers uh, and STEM teachers in our uh, state system and trying to make sure that we have the flexibility to pay you know, science, math, those harder to fill positions, giving them a little bit more opportunity in terms of um, compensation. We've also had uh, language which we did move in terms of licensure recipro reciprocity. We know that that's a problem, um, that we need to make sure that there's uh, more uh, movement available across state lines. Uh, one of the things that Linda mentioned a little bit, and we've had discussions on, we did not move it, but we continue to have uh, discussions on it, is most pension plans across the country for teachers have tended to be defined benefit instead of defined contribution. As you start looking at millennials and looking at the number of careers they have, um, and if you want to have the flexibility of moving across state lines, uh, defined contribution plans uh, may make more sense in terms of providing more flexibility and opportunities for uh, teachers to move and, and move uh, in different areas, especially if you are a teacher coming in, a late, later career teacher, it might make more sense to have a defined contribution plan rather than a defined uh, benefit. We also are focusing on leadership development. I think that um, this is one thing that we hear frequently from a number of our educators and superintendents is that there's a huge need for leadership development and having high quality leaders. You, it is very difficult to retain a highly effective educator if they don't feel that they have a supportive and effective administrator. I think Linda's last slide where she had the reference to uh, from the teacher from Minneapolis kind of just basically supports that, that teachers want to make sure that they have administrators that are supportive. If you have low quality administrators that provide uh, definitely creates problems. Um, we are looking at, uh, as we move forward, trying to figure out more ways to provide time for collaboration. It's part of the international study as shown, as Linda referred, we spend uh, more time in the classroom, less time uh, in terms of collaboration. We're trying to figure out how we can do more vertical and horizontal collaboration among, among educators. I think it would help in terms of uh, student proficiency because they could uh, use that in time, times for remediation or talk about how they could help students. It also helps uh, align our uh, class a little bit more. Um, one of the uh, 
Uh, one of the other issues we're looking at is administrative efficiencies. Indiana is probably not a lot different than many states. I know that Illinois has more school districts than we do. We have 292. What we're finding is that we have, um, I meet monthly with a group of superintendents that are urban as well as rural. And uh, just on Monday when we had our meeting, we were talking about base salaries. And in Indiana, one of the smaller um, rural districts starting salary for teachers was 27000 um, But you move to Indianapolis or Marion County, they're starting salaries of 42000 When you have school districts that get below a population of 500 students, it becomes very ineffective and uh, you, you spend a lot of money uh, paying for the support of the administrative overcost of having a superintendent assistant, super business manager, et cetera. Uh, we, I think, need to, if we want to drive more money down into the classroom, we need to look at better ways to more efficiently uh, look at systems. Uh, one thing that Linda didn't mention, but that Mark Tucker has mentioned in their international study, is that the United States spends almost more than any other country on, it, on K-12 education. However, the way we uh, spend the money is significantly different because it's not getting down to the classroom. Um, the last item I'll talk about is I do, um, I work for a, a non-public university in Indiana, Marion University. We are uh, the fifth largest licensure of teachers, and we are actually taking another uh, page of this international study and uh, kind of basically supporting uh, some more of what Linda has said, and we are creating a, a model a residency model where we will be using um, a pipeline model, which I think Linda also mentioned, where we will be working with partnering districts to uh, create this pipeline cadet teaching program within the district, and then we will create this residency so students from our program will graduate with a master's degree after a one-year residency, and um, they likely will be aligned. We have a medical school very closely to what you would with an inceptor, a preceptor in a medical school program so they will uh, get compensated as a resident but not at the same level as you would uh, if you were a full-time teacher but you would actually get compensated but we have to be very uh, intent in terms of making sure that we find those preceptors that will uh, are highly effective teachers who would be master teachers who would be will make them adjunct um, professors for instance in the university to make sure that we have the rubrics that would support that um, one note as well that I think this will help address is that in the United States, our turnover is almost twice that of our international competitors, especially within the first five years of people uh, leaving the uh, teacher prep program. So if we could find a better way to uh, bring them into the system, feel, have them feel like they are more supported and, and more prepared to learn or to teach, uh, we are hopeful that that will um, have a significant impact on reducing the turnover as well. And with that, um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Appreciate the time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Representative Benning. Um, I can hear the virtual round of applause for all three of our uh, panelists today. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to remind everybody that the um, Following the webinar, the Learning Policy Institute, the Chiefs, and the uh, National Conference of State Legislators will all post the slides and the recording so it's available as a resource uh, to you. We have about 10 minutes for questions and answers. People have already started to put some um, up there, so uh, please feel free to join in. Um, let me start with a question that uh, came in very early in the webinar, uh, and this is for you, uh, Secretary Shop. Um, to just elaborate a little bit more on your Grow, grow Your Own uh, program, because the question was, how can we best develop teachers in, in remote areas for rural schools that are far away from uh, universities? And this uh, question is from Judy Naffin. So that's for you, Secretary Schaff. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the program that we are currently implementing on, in some of our reservation schools is a mix of online as well as sort of the cohort model. And so um, when we talk about remote areas, this is probably 150 miles from the nearest uh, university setting. We also have a tribal university who is a partner along with this, which is somewhat closer. And so the cohort um, model is working where not only do we have this cohort going to the university, but we also have college professors who are coming out to um, the reservation setting and providing instruction on weekends when possible. So. 
it's a, a pretty unique sort of way in which we're trying to provide that opportunity. And again, these are individuals who have at least an associate's degree, and those are the models. That's the model that we're using there that seems to work quite well. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Secretary Shop. It's a very, very interesting program for a, you know, it's a very ch challenging uh, uh, issue of getting teachers out into remote rural areas. Um, there was another question uh, from John Seco, uh noting that uh, Professor Darling Hammond had mentioned the importance of induction or support for teachers at the beginning of their career. Um, and wondering whether uh, either Indiana or South Dakota have worked with teacher preparation programs around the issue of induction support. And Representative Benning, uh, do you do anything in Indiana related to support for new teachers? Well, um, we have created, uh, are working on developing a stronger mentor program. Uh, as I said, at Marion University, we are uh, beginning uh, the program, have a residency program, which is the you know, even a stronger, it would be a one-year induction type program. Uh, I recently uh, was on a phone call because we're partnering with, uh, or working together with Xavier University, who is looking at something similar in uh, New Orleans, and they're actually going to be moving to a residency model. And I uh, heard this morning that um, Louisiana State Board of Education actually has mandated that all their teacher prep programs have to move to a uh, when your residency before their students will move forward. So the induction is uh, hopefully much stronger. Now, mandating everyone do it at once is going to be, I would think, uh, uh, somewhat of a difficult uh, task. But uh, it's something that Indiana is looking at. Uh, we're having an international study breakout specific to Indiana, and uh, it's one of the things that we're uh, looking at, trying to figure out policy levers to get our teacher prep programs, number one, looking at trying to increase the rigor, and number two, to try to ha how do we motivate them to uh, do a better job of induction and support beyond uh, that first year as well. So um, those are things that we will continue to look on look at. Um, part of it, will, we believe, can be done based on funding models. For instance, um, the 21st century, I mean, 21st, not 21st century, but the next generation, who's your educators, uh, scholarship, we could uh, redirect that money to only to those institutions who start following the what we think are best practices to make sure that we're um, getting the best and retaining the best in the classroom. Thank you very much, um, Representative Benning. Uh, Dr. Darlingham and I was going to ask you a couple questions. There's two relevant questions, one from David Taus, which says, um, it seems like we're talking about the, the supply of new teachers always coming from young people just out of university. What about career changers who rep, uh, represent a, a grade and largely untapped uh, potential? And then a, then a related question from Sharon Etz, uh, given teacher shortages and hard to fill content areas like science and math, has there been consideration given to try to incentivize people who work in those fields professionally to earn a teaching certificate and take their knowledge into the classroom? Dr. Hemp? Yes. Um, and yeah, there's been a lot of movement in some states to uh, create program models that are not just undergraduate pathways, which assume, you know, people will decide to be a teacher in their first career. Uh, so there are a lot of graduate level programs. Residency models are one such approach, which are targeted primarily at people who have already graduated. Uh, in San Francisco, for example, almost all their math and science teachers are coming through the residency. Many of them are career changers from math and science fields, technology fields, engineering. Uh, and in one year, they can get clinical experience under the wing of a great teacher, get all of their coursework, uh, you know, finished get their credential, um, and be teaching a year later, having had support for living costs and tuition um, and um, making that commitment then to <clears throat> graduate level programs of various kinds um, are also meeting the need for those mid-career changers. There are a lot of places in the country that have created pathways directly from some um, Corporations, for example, Boeing and uh, other uh, folks in the airspace industry uh, created a pathway for early retirees who wanted to go into teaching, worked with universities to create a pathway directly in with um, streamlined coursework and clinical support. So I think it's a, a great 
thing to do, uh, bringing people in who have that maturity and knowledge base of how the work is actually applied in the world is very important. And there are a growing number of models that make it possible and productive for people to come in and learn the part that they don't know, which is how do you work with kids and uh, with kids of a wide range of needs and uh, bringing their content knowledge together with the teaching knowledge. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Darling Hammond. Um, I'm going to direct the next question back to Secretary Schaaf. There's a question that says, what can we do to convince government officials and policymakers as well as the public to pass viable solutions that actually benefit all teachers and students? And this is from Steve Moreno. So uh, you had spoken a little bit at the beginning about uh, sort of building the political will. Secretary Schaaf? Um, I believe the most important thing that we did, because we there's been many efforts over the last few years. I've been um, doing, you know, this sort of lobbying effort on the behalf of education for over a decade. But the thing that was different this time was um, basing it on um, data. And so we did a lot of data analysis, and it wasn't just anecdotal. Um, we really laid the need out in front and, and attached it to how we want to we're not just investing in teachers, we're investing in our students in the future of South Dakota. And building that coalition and bringing along every single group, as Representative Banning showed, all those groups that came together were the same groups that came together, studied the issue. The governor got out behind this and said, we really need to do this for the state, for the future of that, and really making sure that it wasn't something that just one or two groups or it wasn't just the education field complaining about not having enough resources, but it was really looking at it systemically with the data and the information behind that to support it. And I truly believe that that is what made the difference this time um, than all the other efforts that we've ever made before. Thank you, Secretary Schaap. Um, Representative Benning, uh, there, there's a question uh, specific to Indiana. When you created these career pathways for, for teachers, how, how is that sustainable, and doesn't it require a lot of uh, extra funding? Actually, in um, the way the career pathways models work, it is um, sustainable within existing funding. Um, one of the things that Linda talked briefly about class sizes and things like that is we looked at our international study of education and one of the things that I, uh, Mark Tucker, who's with National Center for Education and Economy, talks about, you know, you've got different um, ideological backgrounds from the left and from the right, you know, one school choice from the right, the other one on the left may be uh, class size. What the, the reality is that the data shows that unless you get down into fairly small class sizes that there's not really significant uh, difference now it depends on the, the obviously the the age of the students as well as their uh, you know the makeup but um, as we look at the rest of the world they had much larger class sizes and one of the ways that uh, career pathways or opportunity culture works is that they use a uh, highly effective educator a master teacher would be the one that would for instance be the uh, one that would have an opportunity to have make more money. It's very selective in terms of how these teachers move up in their career. But um, what ends up happening in, in the school district that's doing it, in town, pub, in, you know, public schools, they're using urban teacher residents. Um, so these are students who have already graduated from college who are in the residency part of their um, education, and they are actually the paraprofessionals, so to speak, in the classroom. So they pay them significantly less. The classroom is a little bit larger, but you have a master teacher, a highly effective educator that is overall uh, in charge of the classroom. Uh, the research uh, public impact is done, especially through Charlotte Mecklenburg, shows that the student performance is moving forward more. They are actually getting more than a year's worth of growth from almost all of the demographic sectors in the class. And uh, the teachers, like I said, in Charlotte Mecklenburg make up to $25,000 more per year in a sustainable model. So IPS is just starting it, and um, they've negotiated it into their contract with the teachers' union. So it is sustainable. Uh, one of the things that it, it does cost up front, and um, we're looking at uh, having some grant money to help because these are all models that are brought to, to the school districts by educators. So educators are coming saying, hey, this is kind of a new model I would like to try, you know, and, and so we have had philanthropy in Indianapolis public schools 
help support them putting together these models. And now, like I said, IPS has put them into place and in finding a significant uh, differentiated to pay for those uh, teacher leaders inside of this uh, traditional union model. Thank you very much, Representative Benning. Um, unfortunately, we've reached our the 10 o'clock hour, 1 o'clock on the East Coast, and so we don't have time for additional questions. Um, if there are questions that have popped up here that we haven't gotten to yet, we'll try to get back to you on them. And remember that the um, the sponsors and their the, the presenters and their organizations have their contact information uh, up on the screen. So thank you all for joining the webinar, which was hosted by the Learning Policy Institute, the Council of Chief State School Officers, and the National Conference of State Legislators on building a strong, sustainable teacher workforce. We hope it has been helpful to state leaders and others who participated today to work to respond to teacher shortages in your own states. Reminder that we will be posting the recording and slides from today's webinar on the learningpolicyinstitute.org website in a day or two as well as will the uh, Council of Chief State School Officers and the National Conference of State Legislators. We will email attendees when they're available. Thank you again and have a great rest of your Wednesday.